Association of the Rema Bible Church in Randburg in Johannesburg for the launch of the national campaign against the abuse of women and children. The organizers want to create awareness of the campaign and support the 16 days of activism. And as the patron of the moral regeneration movement, Ramaphosa was invited by the National Religious Leaders Council. Ramaphosa says violence against women and children has become an ep epidemic in the country. We do apologize for the bad sound in the following visuals. Allow me <coughs> to commend the Rima Bible Church for taking up the struggle to end violence against women and children. By the church taking up this step, and this display that we just saw, the church is essentially directing itself to one of the most devastating social crises of our young democracy. Violence against women and children has become an epidemic in our land. It has spread through society through the breadth and the length of our country, sparing no social group or class. It shows also no sign of abating. The sense we get, whether true or not, is that the problem is actually getting worse. And this is of great concern and should be of great concern to all of us. It is a matter of great concern to government and Minister Shabangu in this month, Women's Month that starts in a few days, is going to be launching a massive campaign that is meant to engage all of us as South Africans to do something to end violence against women and children. Gender-based violence in the end is not caused by a virus. It's not a something, a disease that is transmitted through coughing or physical contact, but it can certainly be spread, and we have seen it spreading. It is spread in the same way that attitudes and modes of behavior are transmitted. There should be no man in our land who should ever believe that because of their being, their existence, and their manhood, they should have dominion over any woman in our country. Instead, this view, as we have seen, has been handed down generation after generation. And it is an attitude that we need to curb. It is amplified through social custom, culture, as well as popular media. It is amplified in the social and economic arrangements of society, where men occupy most positions of authority and responsibility, where men earn much more money than women doing exactly the same jobs, where men receive greater social recognition. This arrangement which we know as patriarchy is not natural. It is constructed by people and it can be taken apart and deconstructed by people indeed. Therefore, if we are to end violence against women and children, we need to confront this concept of patriarchy in all its forms, in all its manifestations, and wherever and whenever it happens. As early as 1884, there was this great writer and theoretician, 
and philosopher. In his treatise, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, Frederick Engels spoke about a new society where there would be what he envisaged, a new generation of men who never in their lives have known what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money or other social instruments of power. A generation of women who have never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any other considerations than real love or to refuse to give themselves to their lover from fear of economic consequences. He envisaged a society with fundamentally different gender relations, a society that we should seek to build, where men and women would be equal in status, both economic opportunity as well as the rights that they all should have and enjoy. This is the society that we should build. This is the society that we should have in South Africa where men and women are equal. This is the type of society that has resonance with the African Union's Agenda 63 that sees the women of our continent fully empowered in all spheres, including social, economic, political, and in other ways. Gender 63, Agenda 63 rather, is about the continent that we envisage, the continent that we seek to build, where the women of Africa walk tall, the women of Africa feel completely empowered and supported by the men of this continent. <laughs> Goal five of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals also speaks to the empowerment of women and also stresses the issues of economic rights that women should have. If we are, as a nation, to end violence against women and children, we not only need to change society, we also need to change ourselves. As men, though we may live in a patriarchal society, there is nothing that compels us to hurt women. As adults, there is nothing that compels us to harm the children, the beautiful children of our land. Each one of us, regardless of our upbringing, each one of us, regardless of our social circumstance, has been given the power of free will we can make a decision, each of us, not to engage in violence and not to perpetrate abuse. We are responsible and should be responsible for our actions, every one of us. And we have the power to choose not to com commit acts that can be hurtful or that can hurt other people. We have the power to respect and to protect those who are vulnerable in our society. And because of our past, because of the horrors that our country has been through, through the years of colonialism, through the years of apartheid oppression, Yes, there are many people in our country 
who become vulnerable, people who've been made vulnerable through poverty, people who've been made vulnerable through inequality, and people who are also vulnerable today because of the high levels of unemployment. And our task as a people, and we certainly see this as our task as a government, to protect those who are vulnerable in our society. That is why it is so important for a church to take up this struggle because violence and abuse has much to do with the choices that people make. It has much to do with the state of their soul and the strength of their own convictions. The church speaks to the soul. The church addresses issues of convictions. And it is therefore the reason I applaud the Rima Bible Church and indeed all religious entities in our country for having initiated and taken up this campaign of violence against women and children. And at times of trial and tribulation, at times when our nation is tested, and at times when we are facing real difficult moments, it is when we turn to the church to guide society on the path of righteousness. <clears throat> Reverend Pastor Macaulay and I, when I arrived, were reminiscing a little bit in the room as we sat waiting for the service to start. And we recalled the work that we did in the 1980s when violence was raging through the length and the breadth of our country, particularly here in Gauteng and KZN. And that is when the church, <clears throat> the church leaders and the church was called upon to help the nation address this issue. <clears throat> but the church did not only come forward to address this issue, the church came forward to heal the nation to heal the wounds. <clears throat> and it was during those worst days of apartheid when we turned to the church for hope and courage. And all of us will remember that that is when the church searched to the fore and gave our people hope and courage. And we fought... <clears throat> a righteous struggle for a democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, and just and prosperous South Africa. We turn to the church and to other faith-based uh, groupings because we believed that God had made all people, black and white, male and female, in his own image. We read from the same Bible, we sang the same hymns, albeit in different languages. We turned to the church for solace and for refuge. We learned that the barriers that had been erected between our peoples, barriers that separated us, were not God's will, but the fiendish creation of man. We learned also that God's love is not bound by race or gender or class. God's love is boundless and it is expansive. We also learned that God's love does not favor one over another. God loves us all equally. And so we have come here today to seek refuge, to find solace, to draw strength, and to learn what God teaches about the way 
we should treat each other and how we should behave towards each other, particularly as men and women. We do so because gender-based violence cannot be ended merely through crime-fighting strategies. By its nature, much of gender-based violence ha happens in hidden corners, in hidden areas. Much of it takes place in the home, involving people who know each other, intimate partners or parents and, of, and children. Too often the family and close friends conspire to keep such acts of violence hidden from the view as we saw the placards that were being displayed here. Too often when children are abused, we call family meetings instead of reporting a crime. We allow perpetrators to escape without remorse, repentance, or even justice. And that needs to change. And I think all of us agree that this needs to change and it must change now. Yeah. An act of violence against a woman or a child is not an unfortunate incident of the sort that affects any family from time to time. It is a deliberate and brutal act of aggression and is a violation of the rights of the person against whom it is being perpetrated. It should not be hidden away. The perpetrator should be held to account as the young people who are standing here were demonstrating. The survivor should be protected, should be supported, and should also be empowered. It is to the great credit of the Rima Bible Church that you are speaking out on this issue. And it is also to the great credit of the various other religious leaders that we saw when the campaign was being launched, that they are speaking out and taking up this campaign as a most serious one. It helps to bring this into the open and embolden those who are survivors and embolden those who want to participate in the campaign to bring an end to violence against women and children. It should also help to conscientize all of us, but particularly those who might otherwise have allowed themselves to become also perpetrators of this crime. More than that, the church also has an important role in ministering, ministering to men and assisting those who need to overcome patriarchal attitudes and violent tendencies. The church does need to take this up as a serious campaign because the church is the best when it comes to counseling. It is at the church that people come to help for help and for counseling. And this is where the church is well placed. Pastor Macaulay, this is your expertise. Because <laughs> perpetrators may come to church seeking absolution. And the church should embrace them. The church should counsel them. The church should assist them. And the church should also empower them to get out of the grip of this patriarchy behavior that they may be under the grip of. But the church is also good at providing counsel on how one should seek forgiveness, but also expects that it requires that people take responsibility for their actions and that they truly repent. And repentance is not the acknowledgement that one has been caught or embarrassed. We need to hold perpetrators, yes, to be accountable. 
Otherwise, we all will be accessories to making this scourge to perpetuate. We become responsible for allowing others to continue if we do not assist them. In working to end violence against women and children, we need to ensure that men themselves are centrally involved in this campaign. I remember very clearly one of the great leaders of our country, Oliver Reginald Tambu, as being the one person who, when he realized that the African National Congress needed to embark on a massive project of empowering women, he is the one who took up the campaign and led from the front and said as president of the ANC, I am going to take this campaign and take everyone by the scruff of their neck and lead from the front to make sure that the women of South Africa are empowered, that the women of South Africa are not left behind and that they get into their rightful positions. And today, when the women in the ANC said we wanted 30% representation in the structures of the ANC, he was the first to say, why not more? And indeed, 30% was accepted. Thereafter, it became 50% and it became easy. And it is when organizations chant, chant this campaign that women must be empowered, abuse against women must stop, violence against women and children must stop, that all of us as a society will be reaching a higher level of awareness, of, of conscience, and of development. That is what we need to do to walk in the footsteps of a leader like Oliver Tambo, who led this campaign from the front. I invite all of us to be like Oliver Tambo and lead this campaign from the front, particularly us men. So therefore, men need to organize themselves in a sustained campaign to make sure that the women of our country are empowered, to make sure that there's no violence against women and children, it should be a man-involved campaign. Individually and collectively, they need to understand that their actions will now determine the kind of society our children will live in tomorrow. Because through our actions as men, we are planting the seeds of the type of society that we want South Africa to be. We should combat also the objectification of women. We should reject the idea of women as possessions of men and resist and resist this notion of men as being the dispensers of all that is good for women. Because by so doing, we are making women objects. By so doing, we are making them objects that can be dispensed with at any time and in any manner. We should also resist this practice that has been spreading in South Africa of bless us. of bless us who prostitute young women I'm the chairperson of the South African National AIDS Council as deputy president 
And in that role, together with the church, together with a whole number of other uh, organizations, we've built up one of the most wonderful structures, which is fighting the scourge or this epidemic, HIV and AIDS. And we've added tuberculosis as well. We did a study recently and found that whilst we have achieved a great deal in saving the lives of millions of South Africans, millions of our people who are afflicted by HIV, by government having come to the fore and put almost 4 million South Africans on ARVs, we found that as we are making progress reducing the incidence of HIV in our land, there is another, another frightening process that is underway. An increase of HIV amongst young girls aged 14 to 25. And that is increasing at an alarming rate of about 2,000 every week of young girls who are being infected with the HIV, with the HIV virus. And this is happening as the research which was done by university-based academics. It is happening at that cohort, 14 to 25, because these are adolescent girls and young women who are the most, some of the most vulnerable in our society. And they are contracting HIV from blessers, from older men. Because older men are the one who entice them, who entice them with smartphones, fancy shoes, money, and everything else. They entice them and they give them the HIV virus. Now, we found that the young men are not really contracting HIV at that level. But then when these young girls then become women who should now get married, they then infect these young men that they finally should marry. Then we are caught in a vicious cycle as a country. And that is why putting on my political hat, putting away my preacher hat this morning, <laughs> I say, pan, sing, I'm a blesser, pan, see. <laughs> That's why I say, away with blessers, away. And that is why, as a nation, we need to become aware of this phenomenon. And whenever I talk to people who are parents of young children, particularly young girls, I say, as parents, let us look after our young girls, from adolescence right to the young woman level. As a parent, you must look after them with a hawk's eye. Every day, every hour, you must know where your child is. And the reason I'm saying this was reinforced for me when one of the ladies <clears throat> who works for us said at home, said, my, my sister's daughter, no longer listens to me. And I said, why? She says, no, she's 16. Uh, the other day when I w had gone for a vigil in another family that had experienced the death, she didn't sleep at home. And then she says, and now these days I've noticed. Oh, she said, I bought her a phone, like a Nokia phone, you know, the one that you press, 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 press. <laughs> This young girl said, no, I don't want this phone. I already have a smartphone. And all of a sudden, some new clothes started appearing, new shoes. And I said to her, are you aware of what is happening? She said, no, Daddy Ramaphosa, what is happening? I say, this young girl now has a blesser. This blesser is buying her a smartphone buying her shoes, buying her new dresses and all that. 
And I say, wake up as a mother, even though she's your sister's child. You are a mother to her. You need to find out where this comes from. She went and asked this girl. She put it down and said, where does it come from? The girl confessed. There was a 40-something-year-old man around already. And that is why, and I'm deviating from, from what I needed to talk about, and that is why we say, that's why we are saying, as parents, we must look after these young girls and adolescent girls and young women like a hawk's eye and ask questions. When she has a smartphone, where did she get it? When she has a bundle of money, where did that money come from? Because it is these fellows who bring these smartphones, these smart shoes, these uh, everything else that these young girls get. And as parents, we need to curb that. And it is for that re- reason we must help these young girls and these young women reclaim their own identity. We must make sure that they become girls and grow up properly. And they must reclaim the control over their own lives and over their own bodies. And this is what we must insist on. The time has come for us to speak out. Now, before I even move on, we then launched as Sanak this campaign which we call She Conquers in response to what we saw happening. It's a massive campaign costing something like two billion rand. It was conceived by young girls themselves. They are driving it, they are leading it, and it is meant to empower young girls. It is meant to make them strong to resist these bless us. It is meant to get them to control their own bodies, their own lives. It is meant to also open up economic opportunities, education opportunities, because what we seek to do through this campaign is that they stay in school. They stay in school at university because what often happens is that they fall pregnant and they fall out of school and their lives are going to be messed up forever and in a day. So this campaign, which is called She Conquers, well named because we want our young girls, our adolescent girls to conquer and to win so that they can play their rightful role in the life of our country as we move on. Just This is now the time for us to speak out about all these matters. Just as we did during the period of apartheid struggle, we must mobilize all sectors of society against violence against women and children, but also against the scourge of the spread of HIV. The church must also participate in this campaign and must take responsibility. Men must also take responsibility. By becoming agents of change, men can only help liberate women from oppression, from exploitation, but also liberate themselves as perpetrators of inhumane savagery. As Nelson Mandela taught us, the oppressor must be liberated just as surely as the oppressed. A man who takes away Another person's freedom is a prisoner of hatred. He is locked behind the bars of prejudice and narrow-mindedness. I am not truly free if I am taking away someone else's freedom. That's what Madiba said. Just as surely as I am not free when my freedom is taken away from me. The oppressed and the oppressor alike are robbed of the, their humanity. It is time for all of us to change our ways. And there are lots of things that we still have to do in our country. Yes, this campaign 
is a big campaign which all of us need to get engaged in. But similarly, what I spoke about is also a massive campaign. The campaign to end violence against women and children begins with me and you today. And let us take responsibility. The other major campaign that we have to launch in our country, which is really a disease that has spread widely, is to end corruption. We must end corruption in our country. We must bring it to an end because it is this corruption, this corruption that manifests itself in a variety of ways. Because indeed, also this violence that we're talking about is perpetrated against women and children. And in my view, it also manifests itself as part of this disease of corruption all around. We need to end corruption because it robs the vulnerable. It robs the most needy in our society of all that they should get to advance in their lives. But what it also does, it holds the growth of our economy back. Our economy right now is in dire straits. But it is even in more dire straits because there is widespread corruption that all of us must engage in and end. It is also on corruption that we must speak out. It is also on corruption that we must take action. It is only when all of us take action against all these ills that are taking place in our country that we will be able to build a South Africa of our dreams. That is when we will have social cohesion. That is when we now bind ourselves as a nation, a nation that is proud of being called true South Africans. Let us all rise and do what is right to build the South Africa of our dreams that we can then bequeath to our children. Thank you very much. That was uh, Deputy President Sir Ramaphosa speaking in his own capacity as a patron of the Moral Regeneration Movement out at the Rayma Bible Church talking about uh, some of the steps and stances that, of course, they as an organization have taken to kickstart uh, the start of the 16 days of activism, activism against the abuse of women and children. Let's have a look now at uh, other news.